Before I get started, I'd love for everybody to just close your eyes, relax, take a deep breath. Now keep them closed for the remainder of this talk, only because I just don't want to know that you're just staring at me the whole time. But I would like, open your eyes by the way, I can't see anything. I would like to ask a question. By a show of hands, who likes to eat? Okay, good. It's not surprising that everybody raises their hand because we need food. We need food to sustain life. In fact, it's not surprising that you're driving down the roads and you see bumper stickers such as, no farms, no food. It just makes sense. And in fact, our agricultural community is necessary for sustaining life. Now, I'd like to start with a small, short story. It, inv it involves Farmer Joe, a picture that my daughter drew, drew for me. So, Farmer Joe, he is, he's concerned. In fact, I'd say he's gravely concerned because the quality of his crops are going down. And he's fairly confident that this has to do with this global decline in pollinator species. In fact, he knows it to be true because of stories he's heard from his father and his father's father, those kind of generational folklore stories that we know and come to love. And he can't recall the last time that he's seen a honeybee or a wild bee or another pollinator. But what he doesn't know is solar farms, are they impacting him at all? He doesn't know the answer to that. And he does not know exactly where he's going to go from here. But what he does think, and he questions is, can they be part of the solution and help? Can they be part of the solution? That's the question at hand, and that's exactly what I want to talk to you about today. And again, my name is Chris Dramby. When I was afforded this opportunity to come and speak today, I was very excited because I want to talk about the passion that I've been doing for the last nearly two decades, tromping around in the woods, studying wildlife, looking at them in their own ecosystems, and making solutions for people. Solar energy is a growing, renewable, clean energy that is growing at rapid pace. Basically, we're taking light from the sun and creating this clean energy to the end user in the form of electricity. It hasn't always been that way, though. A high visibility for solar at one point was during the Carter administration. If you recall, where solar was put on top of the White House. One would argue that equally visible was when it was removed by the Reagan administration, setting up the controversy and discussions that we still have today. In fact, a small town in North Carolina, they banned solar farms altogether because of the potential for the, for the light to be robbed from the sun and us not to have the opportunity for light. We know that that's just not the case as scientists. The evolution of solar has been up and down. In the 80s and 90s, we were plagued with high costs and long payoff returns. But in the 90s, things started to shift a little bit. The energy market went to deregulations in some states, and as a result, that opened up opportunities for energy markets, competition, thus renewables, things like solar. But it was not until the mid-2000s, 2006 time period, with the investment tax credit, which really spurred solar development, driving down costs with the application of new technology, solar is where we're at today, and they call it the perfect storm. Maryland specifically is a smaller state in comparison to some of the much larger states like California, 42nd in land area, but it's ranked 12th in solar power per capita, or 11th in solar megawatts, but 5th in solar megawatts per square mile. Maryland is very invested in solar and renewables, and they have plans for additional solar throughout the state. So reflecting back to Farmer Joe, of his problem of poor quality in his, in his fruits and vegetables, as a, as a declining pollinator species are present. Now, when we think about pollinators, one thinks about bees. 
wild bees, domesticated bees, but there's many other wonderful organisms of pollinators, things like butterflies and bats and birds, many other wonderful creatures that help with our pollination system. When we talk about pollinating, we're talking about taking the pollen from the male anther of the flower and depositing that in the stigma, the female portion. That's just plant romance. Now, after we have fertilization, we get our, our vegetables and our fruits. What would life be like without wonderful, vivid red tomatoes to utilize? Tequila, anyone? Without this wonderful relationship of bat and flower, you wouldn't be able to have margaritas or make poor choices at 3 a.m. at the local pub. It just wouldn't be possible. Blueberries, I don't know what life would be like without blueberries and these wonderful insects. Watermelons, Maryland is rich in history as it relates to watermelons. What happens if we did not have these wonderful species? Or this past Tuesday, there would have been a lot of unhappy folks during Valentine's Day if it wasn't for these species here. There would not be an opportunity for chocolate. So this is at the very root of Farmer Joe, talking about quality of crop. And as a result of the decline in pollinator species and available habitats, we're seeing this decline in our fruits and vegetables. And that's experienced and seen through these production of, lack of production of seed and malformations in the fruits and vegetables, which then talks about and dictates the quality and the taste. It's just not there. So I want you to look at this, and I want you to see this wonderful, wonderful example of what our bees are doing, what our wild bees and our domesticated bees, what they provide, all these wonderful fruits and vegetables. Now I want you to think about this. What happens if we removed them? They were gone and off the system. This is what we'll see. Do I have your attention now? The importance of these animals to the well-being of the human race and sustaining life is critical. There we go. So you may ask, why is this happening? There's a number of reasons why our pollinator species are declining. The use, the indiscriminate and inappropriate use of chemicals is one. They're plaguing our pollinator species and declining populations rapidly. Diseases, the varroa mite, impacting our honeybee populations. Habitat loss and fragmentation. The transition of land use from optimal habitat conditions into less suitable conditions for our pollinator species. Large monocultures of intensely farmed areas and then invasive species. As we change land uses and we have these shifts in community types, there's a more opportunity for invasive non-native species to come in which provide little to no food and habitat for these pollinator species. What are we doing about it? Well, right here at the University of Maryland itself, Dr. Dennis Van Engelstorp, who leads the honeybee research at the UNR University of Maryland Bee Lab, they're a major partner and founding member of the Bee Informed Partnership. His lab conducts the largest and most comprehensive honeybee surveys in the world. And fairly recently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service just listed the rusty patch bumblebee because of declining habitat availability for them. So what this means is it's been added to the endangered species list and now afforded protection under the Endangered Species Act. So we've now talked about this glo glo global decline in pollinator species. We've talked about why the solar market just got so hot. And one may say that these are competing issues, completely separate. But what happens if we reframe this and we say, how can solar farms help pollinator species? If we plant within these solar farms pollinator-friendly landscapes and plantings, right there we'd be cutting down on habitat loss and fragmentation and invasive species. 
So right now, when you see a solar farm, you wonder why they put where they're put. Well, there's many criteria that we look for, but when we're citing these, oftentimes they're flat landscapes. They have no trees. We want to make sure that they do not have any federally regulated waters of the U.S. or wetlands or rare threatened endangered species, cultural resources, and they need to be in close proximity to a substation. So when you look at this picture, you can understand that it fits in the landscape here in Maryland and throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. So this is a picture of a solar farm that has been implemented and planted with a stabilization mixture of just grasses and seeds that provide minimal habitat for pollinator species. This is my question is, can we do better? Can we push the envelope and plant pollinator-friendly landscapes? That's the question. The answer is yes, yes we can, and we're doing it. We're doing it in other countries, we're doing it here in the U.S., but we need to be doing more of it. Beyond just the wonderful look and the aesthetics of these rich, biodiverse meadows, they provide optimal habitat conditions for our pollinator species. They also provide opportunities for better water quality by having deeper root zones and root structures which helps infiltrate pollutants out before they hit our aquifers. They provide soil stability and many other benefits. You know, this isn't something that we haven't done before. We've been restoring meadows and creating upland habitat restoration projects for many, many years. But what we can do now is take this expertise gained over the last several years and apply that to a growing, emerging technology in solar energy. In fact, in Minnesota right now, they are the pioneers in pushing this through in that they have this habitat assessment form that in order to claim that your solar facility is pollinator friendly, you have to achieve a score on this to claim that pollinator friendly criteria. In Maryland right now, we've got stakeholders engaged and we're working through the process so we can in fact have our own Maryland centric scorecard so we can implement pollinator friendly landscapes and claim creation of such habitats. So when you look at this picture here, I want you to think that this is basically anywhere in the landscape in Maryland. It could be from the Blue Ridge and the Ridge and Valley all the way to the coastal plain and every physiographic region in between. And as we apply pollinator friendly plantings to these facilities, there are a number of benefits that we can have. First and foremost is a clean, renewable energy. Secondly, opportunities for native seed banks as we implement these pollinator friendly plantings into other programs throughout the landscape. We'll need a reserve of native seeds. There's opportunities for community gardens to come in with the craze and the growth of the uh, farm to table concept. I see community gardeners getting in close to proximity to these solar facilities utilizing these newly planted pollinator friendly landscapes? Or what about the craft brew craze that is currently around the country? You could have honey bringing colonies in close proximity to these solar farms, supporting your local meteries and restaurants. But my favorite is what about the opportunities for living laboratories to bring our next generation of young engineers and scientists into an area to understand the overall sustainability of life. And this brings me back, everything comes back to Farmer Joe. And as we reflect and we say, can solar farms help with his dilemma of pollinator declines? And the answer is yes. By implementing these pollinator friendly landscapes into our solar farms provides the opportunity for Farmer Joe to not only have a clean, renewable form of energy, 
but he will allow us to have a clean, local source of food that's a win-win for Farmer Joe, for us, for the pollinators, and for the environment. Thank you very much.